back to everyone. We are back to our lecture series, Decolonial and Postcolonial Ecologies, Critical Voices from India. Today is the third lecture given by Dr. Asim Shivastava. And today's title is Twelve in the Earth, How It Came to Become a Self-Destructive Globe. As usual, you now also the lecture will go on for approximately 40 minutes and 20 to 30 minutes QA. You can write in the chat or you can you know, raise your hand and ask your question. Please note that the meeting is recorded. So if you are leaving your video, your webcam on, you might appear on the recording later. So this lecture series, as I like to remind everybody, is a monthly event that takes place in the larger context of the Colonial Anthropology Research Project that is led by Dr. Desan Park, financed by the National Research Foundation of Korea and hosted by Seoul National University. It is organized by my colleagues Pooja Ghosh, Mike Stadler, and I. And I want to thank them, as well as Desan, for letting us organize this lecture series. Most of all, today we are very thankful to Asim Shavastava to engage with us on ecosophy and ecology, and to everybody who came to listen today, which is an day also for all of us at the University of India. Thank you for taking time and being with us today. Uh, Asim Shavastava is a writer, a teacher, and an ecological thinker who graduated as a PhD, a doctorate in economics from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in the US. He taught economics and philosophy in different universities in the US, in India, in Norway, and so on. And recently, for several years, he was offering courses in global and Indian ecosophy at Ashoka University in Sonipat, in the north of Delhi. He is navigating between different areas of ecosophy, ecology, philosophy, and economics in both his writings and his guiding students or teaching. And he navigates therefore across all these boundaries, and that's why we are also very happy to have him today. It's very interesting for the kind of um, audience that we have with us today. And he wrote a um, book with Ashish Kotari, who will also welcome in a few months in the same lecture series. Um, so, Turning the Earth, the Making of Global India by Pingui and Prithvi Mantan, which I think is the Hindi translation, but maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, in 2016. And now he's working on several books, and for that you have all my admiration. I'm not able to work on different manuscripts at the same time. Um, one is called The Grammar of Greed, Reflections on a Fatal Ecology. Another one is called The Alphabet of Ecosophy, A Grammar for Twilight Modernity. And the last one for Love of the Earth, Modernity, Ecosophy, and Rabidanam and Tagore. So all these works dialogue in between boundaries, realms, um, different disciplines, and all question the ecological challenges of the 20th century global modernity. And so now it's all yours, I see, for the lecture, and thank you again very much to be with us. Thank you, Elise. Uh, is the audio level all right? Is the video clear for everybody? Yes, it's all good. Okay, okay wonderful. Uh, thank you, Elise. Thank you, Daishyung, Michael, Puja. I would also like to thank the uh, Decolonial Anthropology Research Project, the National Research Foundation of South Korea, FWF in Austria. Uh, this really does feel like a global village every time we uh, sort of meet uh, on Zoom. Uh, at the outset, I would like to say it's humbling for an amateur like myself. Uh, I have to forewarn all of you that I have never taken a single course in philosophy in my life, but I have taught philosophy for five very privileged years. Uh, so I know how to uh, faff around. Uh, it's humbling uh, for an amateur like myself to be granted the privilege to wax eloquent on a theme I know very little about. And uh, as I requested you before uh, we started the meeting, uh, it's much harder to solve the universe in 30 minutes than in 40 minutes. So I asked for a little extra time from Elise. Uh, so please, you know, do indulge me. <laughs> I'm going to begin with... Uh, 
uh, a Hindi poet. Uh, those of you who are Hindi speakers will follow the Hindi, and those who uh, do not know Hindi, I will offer a very lame translation. Uh, the poet is called Jai Shankar Prasad, and he's from my part of India, which also goes by Purvanchal, which is the area around Banaras, Patna, you know, Eastern UP and Bihar. Um, Jai Shankar Prasad is at once uh, one of the great romantic poets and one of the great epic poets, and he has this uh, incredible impossible to translate book. This is my mother's copy from the 1950s. It's called Kamayani, and uh, uh, I won't translate that for the time being. I'll simply recite for you the first verse of the poem. The entire thing is written in verse. The poem begins like this. Himgiri ke uttung shikhar par bet shila ki shital chaam एक पुरुष भी गए नैने से नैनों से देख रहा था प्रायल प्रलय प्रवाह। On the highest summit of the Himalayas, from the cool shadow of a cold rocky shrine, a wizened soul with moist eyes was observing the great deluge. So I'll, I'll repeat that. On the highest summit of the Himalayas, from the cool shadow of a cold rocky shrine, a wizened soul with moist eyes was observing the great deluge. This was written in the 1930s, and it gives you a flavor of the nature of Jai Shankar's epic poetry. It also gives you a flavor of his prophetic sense. He was able to foresee where global modernity is going to go, ecologically speaking. And this is the gift of a prophetic poet uh, that he can see the future in ways which are denied to those who, uh, who are uh, unable to find the courage for that sort of poetry. Uh, now let's look at our world today. Um, why are we constantly in a world in which problems are only growing, they are not lessening. We seem to be dismally inadequate, uh, inordinately stupid, it seems at least at a collective level, no matter how individually smart many people may be, but collectively we seem to achieve remarkable feats of stupidity uh, given the scale of challenges that we face. Why is this the case? Could it be that we are all being led to live in the wrong world? Could it be that an individual cannot possibly live the right life in the wrong world, as someone once said? Uh, could the ecological crisis be at bottom a cognitive crisis and a crisis of collective cognition? We are together not apprehending the world correctly. There's something fundamentally wrong in the way we are actually seeing the world together. Uh, that the crisis might have something to do with the very warp and weft of modern culture, modern metropolitan culture. Could, there, could the problem be right there? So I'm going to explore this uh, proposition a little with you. And uh, I will begin with the most formidable challenge of all, and I am going, going to call it a challenge for very studied reasons. The challenge being science itself, science and its primary offspring, uh, technology, modern technology. Now, uh, a very important and famous Indian historian by the name of uh, Damodar Das uh, Kosambi gave a wonderful definition of science uh, about uh, 100 years ago or maybe 80 years ago. Uh, he said science is the cognition of necessity. So let's say the laws of physics or the laws of light or the laws of science, sound or the principles of magnetism. It's not a matter of whether we like them or don't like them. It's just that they are necessary. And the moment we recognize that this is necessary, uh, this is the way things are, or the way things hang together, uh, we are seen to be scientific. And that's, I think, a very concise, very precise definition of what science is. Uh, 
it stands on three legs. There's theory, which is, which is to say logical reasoning and so on. There's evidence, which is to say experimentation and verification and so on. And the third, which is extremely important and which we tend to forget all too easily, is imagination. It's the imagination which actually offers the hypotheses which are then uh, developed into theories to be tested by theoretical physicists or chemists or whatever. And then you go to the laboratory and the cyclotron or whatever, right? This aspect of the imagination is not only at the root of science, but it actually accompanies science on its entire journey from looking at the stars and, you know, uh, joining the dots in some particular way, proposing that this is the reality and somebody else joining those same dots in a different way, offering a different explanation or illumination of the same reality. Uh, imagination is all along a constant companion of science. And this is the sort of thing which had led Albert Einstein to say, imagination is more important than knowledge something we are prone to forgetting. Now, I want to plead before you that the, the imagination in which metropolitan humanity is living today, and by metropolitan humanity, I mean city dwellers, and especially those of us living in uh, mega or giga cities which are approaching cancerous dimensions, uh, cities like New Delhi, New York, London, and so on, the metropolitan world, the imagination in which we are living is deeply, deeply, uh, you know, a product of modern science and technology. And in order to illustrate this, I want to share with you a video, which uh, I think Michael has ready. This is a video uh, which has been created by a student of mine, and uh, her name is Mridula Sridhar. Uh, she's doing a doctorate in uh, psychology at University of Edinburgh. And, uh, you know, she's also a trained Carnatic uh, musician from, from Chennai. Uh, so we're gonna watch this video. We're gonna listen to the song. Some of you may be familiar with the song. It was actually uh, Mahatma Gandhi's, one of his favorite songs. Let's just listen and watch, and then we can talk about it. Abide with me for 
point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks in earth's way shadows flee. In thy face let the Lord abide with me. In thy face let the Lord abide with me. As some of you may know, uh, this is a Scottish hymn which sailors would sing at sea in, uh, you know, times of trouble. And um, the way Mridula has rendered this, uh, she provokes the following question. Which is the earth we live on? Where are our feet? And I mean by that, I mean that question metaphorically as well as existentially, physically, right? Where are our feet? Are our feet on the distant blue dot in Carl Sagan's words, which you see at the end of this video? Or are they on this carpet on which my chair sits? Are they on the grass outside? Are they on the asphalt outside the house in which I live? Are they on the soil of a farmer's field and so on? The feel for the meaning of that word, the earth, keeps changing as the answer to this question shifts. And this is all important. It sounds a lot simpler than it is. But as someone said, we no longer walk on earth, we walk on asphalt, or we walk on sidewalks, or we walk on you know, staircases, and so on. Now, uh, the way I interpret this rendition of Abide With Me is as a raging cry of the earth. The earth being a living entity, the earth not being a dead geographical uh, fossil, uh, the last wail of a powerful mother, so to speak, about to erupt into unrestrained wrath uh, against the kind of insults that her great great grandchildren are hurling at her. That's the sort of uh, thing that I think of. Now, since Copernicus and Galileo, which means from at least four to five centuries ago, what one might call the planetization of the earth has been going on. So science has been leading what one might think of as the planetization of the earth, which in a spirit of spurious humility, if I, one might call it, has been offering us an image of the Earth as just another planet, right? Like Mars or Venus or Mercury, we are just one among nine or 10 planets and which is part of a solar system, which is one among billions of such setups in the galaxies and so on. And why I say spurious humility is because the, the humility is not really genuine. In other words, we are not approaching the universe in a spirit of awe or wonder or reverence. It is in a spirit of conquest, right? With which we approach the universe, the cosmos, as well as the earth, which is a subset of it. And here is where the rub is. A culture which resides historically uh, in conquest can't not see things this way. As a man is, so he sees, as William Blake said once. Now, parallel to this development of the planetization of the Earth is the globalization of the world. Now, globalization as a term of popular usage has come into vogue in the last generation or so. But globalization has been going on for at least four to five centuries. And what does it mean? It means that the world is getting the human world is getting more and more intermeshed. And the way in which this is happening is through the integration of markets. Markets referring to trade, commerce, finance, investment, and so on, right? 
And much like science has begun to see, not begun, uh, it has been seen for centuries, nature as matter, fundamentally science, modern science is based on philosophical materialism. That's the nature of the metaphysics behind modern science. Uh, parallel to that, economic, quote unquote, science uh, has been viewing nature as resource. As Martin Heidegger said, it's bestand or, uh, you know, a standing reserve of resources. That's the modern utilitarian view of nature. So much water, so much timber, so much lead, so much lithium, etc. Like Elon Musk said to the Bolivians some time back, if you're not going to allow us to access the lithium, we're going to coup you and you deal with it, right? So that's the kind of uh, utilitarian triumphalism if you will, which rules the roost and which is the default setting in all our minds. Now, the person who first notices the danger, which is implicit in the, in the song, which, uh, you know, uh, in the video, which we, which we just saw, is the political thinker, Hannah Arendt. In the 1950s, she writes The Human Condition and she says that we really have to ask the fundamental question whether we, we are willing, after these first voyages into space, we are willing to exchange our beloved Mother Earth for something else in the cosmos which might be better or superior to this Earth, and which would be a product of the most you know, sophisticated developments in technology. This is along the lines of Stanley Kubrick's film, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. You know. So Arendt asked this fundamental question, and with it, there's a pathos, there's a sort of tragic element. Uh, and that is on account of the fact that she says that modern science has found the Archimedean point. You remember the story of Archimedes from ancient Greece. He goes to the king and he says, give me a place to stand and I, I will move the earth, right? me a place to stand and a crowbar and I will move the earth. Modern science finds this place literally, which is to say there are satellites, there are space stations, there are ways in which you can view the earth as a whole from the outside. Not all angles, not all 360 degrees, so to speak, in all dimensions, but you can see the earth from the moon and from space and so on. And here's where the problem is, according to Arendt, because she says we found a way to act upon the Earth, to act upon terrestrial nature on Earth, as though we were all standing off the surface of the Earth. Now, at most about seven or 800 cosmonauts have seen the Earth actually from the outside. The rest of us, however, are living in the imagination which has been generated by the photography done by these astronauts and by the automated, you know, Hasselblad uh, cameras on satellites and so on, right? That's the picture of the Earth, at least since July 1969, when Neil Armstrong went to the moon or when Yuri Gagarin was in space in 1960 and so on it would feel and seem as though we can twirl the earth around our fingers, much like our geography teacher taught us to twirl the globe in the geography classroom in school. Now the globe, let's look at it. The globe is a physical image, a three-dimensional physical image of the real thing. It's not the represented, it's the representation. But globalization has got everybody to believe that this is indeed the real thing. This is the model we're going to be living in, right? Now, the great philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, Russell's uh, you know, co-author of Principia Mathematica, wrote once about what he called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. When we take our thoughts about the world for the nature of the world itself, there is a problem. And he accused most of modern science to be, uh, to be guilty here, you know? So this is what is going on when you hear an IBM tagline, a slogan as powerful and potent and popular as, let's build a smarter planet. As though the planet was built much like a factory or like an automobile or, or a smartphone. And you can dismantle this planet and generate a better one. Because guess what? We are so smart. 
you know our brains are so good that we can take the place of the gods and and do this right so all this world view that emerges from fancy technology aren't compels us to question very seriously and to doubt the, uh, the, 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 not the promises in the sense that she says, let's assume, let's grant the scientists, the astrophysicists and the space scientists, let's grant them the luxury to think that you can actually transport large numbers of humanity to some outer galaxy. Does that mean, shall we do it? For instance, if a woman could be, you know, if a technology could evolve, which would enable a woman to have a baby in one month instead of nine months, shall we have it? If a man could give birth to babies just like women, shall we have it? You know, where are the ethical boundaries of this sort of technological overreach? Or are there no boundaries? Is this the experience of the infinite that we're supposed to endure and enjoy? Or are we paving the way for a certain kind of unpredictable hell? And hell can always get more hellish. So Arendt actually provokes all these questions. I've been reading her for about 25 years and I've taught her for at least, uh, what, yeah, 25 years. Uh, and she always, always, always makes me think new things from the same text. Uh, I'm going to quote to you a few paragraphs, a few passages from the human condition to bring us closer to her mind. Modern science, this is Arendt, not me. Uh, modern natural science owes its great triumphs to having looked upon and treated earthbound nature from a truly universal viewpoint. That is from an Archimedean standpoint taken willfully and explicitly outside the earth. Unquote. Then she says, whatever we do in physics, whether we release energy processes that ordinarily go on only in the sun, or attempt to initiate in a test tube the processes of cosmic evolution, or penetrate with the help of telescopes the cosmic space to a limit of two and even six billion light years, or build machines for the production and control of energies unknown in the household of earthly nature, or attain speeds in atomic accelerators which approach the speed of light, or produce elements not to be found in nature, or disperse radioactive particles created by us through the use of cosmic radiation on the Earth, we always handle nature from a point in the universe outside the Earth. Without actually standing where Archimedes wished to stand, still bound to the Earth through the human condition, we have found a way to act on the Earth and within terrestrial nature as though we dispose of it from the outside, from the Archimedean point." Unquote. So it's as though you uh, are living in a house and you're able to observe the house from a CCTV camera outside and you're operating, you're conducting operations on the house, including breaking it down and building a better house, imagining yourself to be the camera lens or the screen. Something like that is what we are doing, she says, and needless to add, she says, is, if this is not crazy, what is madness? So she quotes uh, a writer, and a writer which many of you have read, Franz Kafka. And Kafka's chilling aphorism, this is now Kafka. Kafka says he found the Archimedean point, but he used it against himself. It seems that he was permitted to find it only under this condition. There you go. Every time we think we are so clever, there's something in nature which is subtler. Francis Bacon knew about it. And that subtler thing kicks in and we hurt ourselves, but we don't even notice we've hurt ourselves because we have salves, we have palliatives, we have escape routes, and we're constantly forging ahead on the great you know, march of progress. Yeah. Uh, so we've long been in the habit of acting upon the earth, upon others, upon ourselves, forgetting all along that this is in fact impossible. 
that we can only act within nature, within each other, within ourselves. That's the way I would put it. Just change that little word upon and, and, and try within and see what happens. You know? Or the other way around. Uh, now, the two dominant perspectives under which the Earth's ecological crisis is understood are environmentalism and ecology. And very roughly, uh, very uh, broad brush, uh, you know, sort of understanding of that would be environmentalism uh, derived from the French word uh, environ, which is that which surrounds us. Okay, so it's as though, you know, uh, you know, when we say environmental, what is in our environment, we are talking about the neighborhood, the physical neighborhood in which we are living. We don't see ourselves as the environment, right? Ecology is a tad better in the sense that we also constitute a certain ecology, a certain microbiome, a certain set of physiological and anatomical structures and processes which guide our biology and so on. But all that science has handled, answered uh, to adequate satisfaction, and we can be treated in hospitals, but primarily as objects, not as subjects. Uh, so modern medicine is about treatment and cure. It's less about healing, uh, so to speak, in the classical sense of the word. Now, the problem with environmentalism and ecology is that environmentalism is fundamentally hidebound to technocracy. And ecology is basically a science. Uh, there are some elements of humanities there, but largely it is a science. And because of this, neither of these two perspectives are in a position to actually face what I think is the central challenge of our ecological crisis, which is the very cosmology of modernity, which is to say earth alienation. They're not in a position to ask fundamental questions about the way we perceive the earth, the way we perceive nature, the way we perceive human communities, the way we perceive ourselves, as though everyone here, including our dog and you know the bullock, which guides the bullock cart outside, all these that might be subjects, but instead of subjectivizing the earth and the cosmos, we are objectifying ourselves in the limiting case, other than objectifying animals and plants and everything around us. So cognitive objectification seems to be the philosophical villain of the piece here. Now, where is all this coming from? We know the answer. It's coming from what's called the European Enlightenment, which is to say the 18th century, which is to say the age of reason, Reason, science, and progress. That's basically the trajectory. And uh, as we know, Immanuel Kant writes this powerful tract, What is Enlightenment, in 1784, in which he says that, you know, to have the maturity to be able to reason for oneself and think for oneself and reach certain conclusions for oneself is what belongs to maturity. And this is enlightenment, right? The Latin for it, if I recall, is sapere aude. Right? Now, is this all? Can a loveless reason really guide our tracks? Or does something other than reason, if you don't like the word love, you can use something else. Is that necessary? Could that be the truth? So here is a poser to you. Um, there are two philosophies. One says, to know is to be. And the other says the exact opposite. To be is to know. And if you want to get to the bottom of this second philosophy, you might ask yourself, do you know something which is not on Google? And if so, how is someone supposed to find it? What do you Google? What word do you insert there? Does the word come at the beginning or at the end? Etc. So, uh, you know, I could tell you a hundred stories about ecological literacy in our country, 
where I found unlettered people who had never seen the back or front of a school to be supremely more ecologically educated and attuned than highly educated people, often with PhDs from the best universities in the world. How do you explain this paradox? What's going on? You know. Uh, so my conclusion to this part of my talk is that instead of sapere aude, perhaps we need to also think about sapere amare, dare to love, not just dare to reason. Uh, reason without love is potentially very dangerous. Love without reason has its own problems, but some sort of balance between these two. And so I, I, I plead again that the ecological crisis is going on getting worse because we are living in the wrong collective imagination of the earth and because uh, we don't recognize that our collective cognition in the metropolitan world is structurally flawed, flawed from long before any of us were born and getting worse because everything is getting built on that foundation. So I'll conclude this part of my talk by uh, again re taking recourse to a poet, one of our great poets in India, 19th century, Mirza Ghalib. And he says uh, in, in Urdu, uh, he says, Ghalib taumr ye bhool karta raha. Ta Ghalib taumr ye bhool karta raha. Dhool chehre par thi aina saaf karta raha. All his life, Ghalib committed this folly of cleaning the mirror and shining the mirror when the moat was in his own eye, right? So that's the, that's the first part of what I wanted to say. Um, it's taken me three quarters of my time. I would have liked to finish it in half the time. Let me do the best with the second part. Now, the second part takes off from Sapere Amare, uh, Dare to Love. And this is where, uh, you know, the figure who has inspired me greatly and who continues to uh, sort of inform so much of my ecosophical thinking is uh, Rabindranath Thakur, uh, in English known as Rabindranath Tagore. Um, and Tagore, as you would all know, was a, a, you know, a, a globally renowned poet, writer, literateur, man of letters, uh, lived about 100 years ago, died in 1941. And uh, there's a lot that uh, has been written about Tagore too much for anyone to actually uh, see the, the ends of. But there's a lot that has not been thought and written about Tagore also. And I'm going to just mention one thing here. Uh, there is a talk that uh, Tagore gives in 1938 in Sriniketan, which is his karma bhumi, his uh, experimental ground uh, in Bengal, other than Shantiniketan, which is much more famous. Shantiniketan is the educational institution. Sriniketan is the place where he does his experiments with crafts and agriculture and sustainable livelihoods and so on. And there he gives a talk in 1938 where he uses a word uh, well, let me say the sentence. My Bengali is terribly imperfect, but let me remember the sentence. Manush gridlu bhave prokriti dan ke grohan koreche, which translates to humanity um, grabs the bounty of nature. Humanity doesn't understand how to accept with grace the bounty of nature. So this word, Gridnu Bhave, which I would like, I would have liked to spend some time talking to you about because it took me a long while to actually get to the bottom of this word. It does not appear in any Bengali dictionary I could find, nor was it known to most of the Bengali uh, intellectuals and experts and pundits I know in Kolkata and Shantiniketan. But be that as it may, the sum and substance of the word that I arrived at, which is actually related to the first shloka of the Ishavasya Upanishad uh, in uh, ancient India, uh, the, the heart of the word is the idea of uh, a vulture and the way vultures approach carrion, you know, carcasses of cattle, is the way humanity is going about exploiting nature. That's basically the idea. 
And at the heart of uh, Rabindranath's understanding of modernity is this, that its attitude to nature is one of see something, grab it. See what use you can make of it. Grab it first, uses will follow, etc. And he is absolutely revolted by this. And I'm going to read to you a few uh, you know, passages. There are hundreds of such passages in Rabindranath's writings. Uh, in 1922, he writes a very important tract. He, uh, he It's called The Robbery of the Soil. And it's uh, something which he, uh, um, you know, uh, writes when Srinaketan is being set up uh, in Bengal. And he says that uh, civilization has turned into a vast catering establishment to conduct feasts for a whole population of gluttons. The price of the intemperance exacted colonially from entire peoples in Asia and Africa, whose happiness is routinely sacrificed, provide fastidious fashion with an endless train of respectable rubbish. So uh, that's the sort of thing he, he, he talks about. He says, he tells an audience, a university audience in Japan, uh, which he visits in 1916 for the first time. And he says, dominating nature from outside is a much simpler thing than making her your own in love's delight, which is a work of true genius. So his aesthetics, his philosophy, his metaphysics, everything was always taking nature into account. Nature was never separate from us. We were never separate from nature. Uh, to know was not to be by itself. To be was much closer to knowing what knowing means, what knowledge means. So knowledge and being were interfused in his understanding. The intellect was constantly in dialogue with the heart and not divorced from it in an objective or an objectified way. Uh, since time is short, let me now begin to conclude my talk. And I'm going to introduce the word ecosophy now. Um, now, as I said, ecology and environmentalism are not in a position or have not found themselves to be in a position to question the fundamental cosmology of modernity. And that's the reason why, at least intellectually, we are not able to come to grips with what we've got before us and within us and around us. Ecosophy is an idea which, uh, you know, uh, the word itself was first used in the 1970s by the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness and uh, by Felix Guattari uh, in, in France. But the sense in which they use the word is actually quite remarkably different from the way uh, Raymond Panikar uses it. And Panikar is the philosopher who I have relied on for my understanding of ecosophy. It's a very simple, elusive definition he offers. He calls it the wisdom of the earth. And he's very careful to qualify that. He says that this is not our wisdom about the earth, for that would be science or something like science. It's the earth's wisdom in and of itself or the cosmos's wisdom in and of itself. I mean, none of us put the earth in motion. Nobody taught the earth how to rotate or revolve around the sun. Nobody taught the moon to go around the earth. So these, there's clearly some intelligence, something, we don't know the word for it perhaps, which is guiding this whole thing, okay? So that's what he's referring to. It's something which stands by itself independent of human volition or understanding. And science is lucky when it comes close to understanding the inner dynamics of the universe or the earth, right? So ecosophy breaks down into the Greek oikos, which refers to home, and Sophia, which is the goddess of wisdom. So the wisdom of the home or the wisdom of the earth as our only home in the vastness of the cosmos. Something like that is a fuller uh, definition. Uh, I will add that ecosophy is not a science, nor is it an ideology. It's not a discipline. Name, 
So uh, it is above all and beneath all a perspective, an angular vision, an approach which can perhaps enable us to reach out to solutions which uh, which are you know uh, perhaps lying in wait, but we are looking for them in the wrong place. And if we are to address the breakdown in our relationship to Mother Earth, uh, then some such perspective is needed. And to have the wisdom of the Earth would also mean if you think that the Earth has an intelligence or a wisdom of her own, or if the universe has an intelligence and wisdom of her own, or I don't know the right pronoun for it, uh, then uh, we would perhaps be wise to allow ourselves to be transformed in the light of that intelligence. And that's what, for instance, our Gayatri Mantra is about in India and so on. I'm going to close with a quotation, however, from Raina Maria Rilke's Ninth Elegy, from the Duino Elegies, which some of you in Europe would have uh, read or been familiar with. And this is what Rilke says. Uh, it's about the earth. And this is what he says in translation. I don't know German. Earth, is it not this that you want to rise invisibly in us? Is that not your dream to be invisible one day? Earth, invisible. What is your urgent command if not transformation? I'll repeat that last line because it's absolutely central to our needs here. What is your urgent command if not transformation? So he's personified the earth. He's put the earth in a position of command. And he's saying the earth wants something from us. Let's try to understand what that is and allow ourselves to be transformed in the process because the earth also has dreams for us, which we might be wise to listen to. Okay, uh, you've been very patient and kind. Uh, thank you for listening. I've taken about 44 minutes, uh, but I think we still have time for some questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for very enlightening talks. Um, okay, so we are ready for some questions. Uh, there are ways you can, you know, use the button to raise your hand or uh, raise your hand visibly or uh, type your question, device, and message. Uh, no, but it's solved to, to query has been solved. Um, yeah. Yeah, let me check if someone oh Pooja has said yes, please. Um uh, thank you, Dr. Srivasta, for such a wonderful talk. Um I was wondering to hear more uh on the approach of ecosophy and like how um you know uh you're witnessing that. Um like especially in terms of wisdom of earth, uh, like are we making a difference between wisdom of earth per se or like wisdom of nature um, or are we seeing earth and nature here like um, simultaneously together um, because um, like um, I was like I have a sort of worry with the notion of wisdom of nature um, coming from a very different perspective maybe a feminist perspective of how this kind of an argument has been taken from an essentialist perspective and you know, how it has been used as a counter sort of like justification against trans people because, you know, it's, it's just almost assumed that men and women have nature and all that. So just like, just thinking the replication of what it, such a theory might look like in a greater sort of like philosophical exchange and stuff. So one was that question of wisdom of earth vis-a-vis -vis wisdom of nature, like, and how we are like looking at me. I mean, if we can also talk a little bit more about nature per se, um, and yeah, just like those questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, let me answer that as best I can because I'm not sure I have a full answer at all. I'm still searching and learning and exploring this. Uh, but here is the way I think about it so far. First of all, there is a terrible, terrible misunderstanding in all of us, I would argue, that uh, the real conflict is between humanity and nature. I actually don't think so. 
I actually think the real conflict is between global capital and the elements. We are all caught in the crossfire between global capital and the elements. So this means that all humanity and all nature are in the middle, getting the bullets from either this side or getting the, uh, the, the blowback from uh, the elements on the other side, right? Now, the moment you pose the question like this, you are asking fundamental questions about the nature of the system and the global system today, which has generated humongous astronomical amounts of unprecedented wealth and made at least a handful of the world richer than entire countries and so on, right? So that's one point. And I think that uh, we all need to really seriously reconsider this whole question of humans have done this and so on in the manner of uh, you will know a Harari or somebody like that, you know, we humans, no, 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 it's not like that. And we should know better than that. And we should reject that line of argumentation straight away, despite so much successfully media propagated aspirationalism, wherein a large number of people without privilege or relatively poor or disprivileged have now developed aspirations to become billionaires or global celebrities or whatever they have been taught to think is their, their path in life, right? So, uh, so we need to really be very careful about this. Uh, the second is, uh, there is a tendency, and I notice it in thinkers like Zizek, for instance, uh, not my favorite philosopher by any stretch, uh, when he says that, you know, everything is natural, you know? No, I mean, I don't think you can take that position. If you say that, then I'm allowed to say, Yes, illness too is natural, madness too is natural. And in fact, you cannot stray from the natural much in the manner of Tao De Ching would say. The Tao is that which you cannot leave, which you cannot abandon, you know? So uh, there's, there's a lot of sicknesses, there's a lot of illnesses, there's a lot of maladies, malformations, which we need to recognize, which does not mean that there is an easy obverse, which is a normal, you see? but uh, the moment you recognize that, you know, a fever is a fever, and if you move from 98.4 Fahrenheit to 99, uh, we feel the change. Uh, it is natural to go to 99, but it's not desirable. Not all things, quote unquote, natural are desirable, right? So there is clearly another element. What is that? And that's where ecosophy, I think, comes in. There is this intangible metaphysical wisdom somewhere, which, uh, which uh, I wouldn't say intrudes, but illuminates our path, uh, you know, and we need to be very mindful of it. And I think that uh, all the questions which are implicit in your big question, and it is a very big question you ask, all the questions which, which are implicit need to be explored piecemeal and very carefully. And I wouldn't like to offer any sort of dogmatic formula which would, you know, answer the question uh, in a sort of on-block way. You know? I don't know if that satisfies you, but for the time being, uh, we could, you know, take that as a starting point. Uh, yeah, that was um, great. I also feel like it ties back to something that you said earlier, uh, because even my question perhaps like, Maybe, I mean, it should be critically handled, but it has also to do with the saturation of European enlightenment and how we have like uh, perhaps understood um, certain categories of thought. Um, and that includes like um, maybe a struggle for with our own sensibilities to make sense of this intangible metaphysical wisdom, as you're rightly noting. So what would it mean for us who are born in this generation to make sense of this wisdom in a very lived way? I think that's also a challenge because we are so saturated in our everyday with global capitalism, but also the way we live our lives, which is like very ra rational, progress oriented. It's a linear teleology of life that we are condemned to live, um, even those of us who have lived our lives in India and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. One more thing, Pooja. Um, since you brought it up, I think it's a very important thing you just said. Why isn't that somebody like Blaise Pascal uh, is an important philosopher, and Immanuel Kant is, you know, 
The reason is very simple. Pascal dares to say the heart has its reasons that reason knows not of. There is a mystery. There's a mystery. In fact, Jay Shankar Prasad, who I was quoting right at the start, the closing chapters of Kamayani uh, move towards darshan rahasya anand. That's uh, darshan is impossible to translate as philosophy, but that's about the nearest seeing of a certain kind. Uh, 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 rahasya is mystery and anand is bliss, right? If you do not experience the mystery of your being, you're unfortunate. You, you should, you're a sad creature, you know, the soul one can say, you know, any one of us who does not experience themselves as a mystery uh, is not living fully, is not going to be happy in the way that we can be, right? There is a certain joy of being. And in that sense, being is always going to be primary and knowledge secondary, something that Oriental wisdom never forgot and Occidental wisdom discarded very early. I'm generalizing. Not everybody did. For instance, Pascal didn't or Rilke didn't, you know, uh, Nietzsche didn't, you know, uh, Kierkegaard didn't. So there's a lot of noble exceptions within the large pantheon of Western thought. But the mainstream and certainly the post-industrial revolution mainstream banished all these people as romantics. So the only thing which is not romantic, not to be romanticized is good urban living with plenty of pollution and rapes and murders and you know wars and such like. That's practical. Let's let's get real, you know. And this is the way they win the argument through basically uh, you know an indication of just how much force they can exercise. So you know there's there's a lot of lazy slothful thinking among the wealthy. Uh, they get away with it. We sh I should say we get away with it. Precisely because of our privilege, we shouldn't be allowed to. Thank you. I will take Ruchi's question in a minute, but I want to take first Rajat's question along with mine, and maybe I saw in green your question is related. We can ask it at the same time because these ones are kind of following up on the topic, and then I'll come back to you, Ruchi. Um, so Rajat is writing uh, again on this kind of uh, definition of reason wisdom to continue on that topic. Does reason of enlightenment allows itself to be synthesized to be synthesized with wisdom? To which I wanted to add my question because it's um, close, which was that you at the beginning of in the first part of your talk you opposed reason with love, the reason of the enlightenment, and love was a kind of a, a solution. It's not the most um, stressful but, you know, response to that. And then you went to speak about intelligence and wisdom of the earth, which I found maybe more fit simply because reason and love have a lot of connotations already. And as you said yourself, love without Sorry, being is dangerous. Yes. I'll have I'll have to interrupt you because I did not oppose reason and love. Okay. I I I in fact on the contrary, I was trying to bring them closer and make them complementary and even sometimes the same thing. And that's mm. that's why I'm quoting Pascal, the heart has its reasons that reason knows not of. Now, the reasons that the heart is aware of are different from mm -hmm. the reason that does not know of those reasons, correct? Okay. Yeah. So and let's it's... not get lost in words uh, because this is tricky terrain and we are used to words being, you know, meaning X because we've used too much of Google. Uh, they, they, they mean one thing and not another thing. So if we are not going to be living in a polysemic universe, where multiple meanings and associations and ambiguities are permitted, then I'm afraid we're living in a world of computer language, not human language, you know? And that's very, very tricky. You know? So, sorry, but I interrupted you. You should complete your question. No, so my question was how to relate this uh, concept from the first part to the concept of wisdom or intelligence of the earth that you mm -hmm. used in the second part, mm -hmm. uh, more generally. 
because um, the, the concept that you were using then, also from Tagore, this grading, you know, modernity as grading, sounded to me a little different than the reason progress of the Enlightenment. So I wanted the kind of a, Good. a transition. And that goes together so with Rajat's question, which is, does reason of Enlightenment allows itself to be synthesized with wisdom? Well, uh... I mean, all these are, again, very big questions, and these are highly soiled and, uh, you know, worn out categories and concepts we are using, and uh, one should be very careful. Um, clearly, a certain kind of instrumental reason, if I may, in the sense of the Frankfurt School's understanding of instrumental reason, Adorno and Horkheimer's understanding of instrumental reason. Clearly, that sort of thing is not what wisdom of the earth or you know some deeper intuitive uh, wisdom uh, is not the same thing as that. Obviously not, you know. But uh, I mean, if you look at the history of the usage of the word reason from ancient times through the Enlightenment period down to the present, it keeps changing. And what reason meant to Socrates is not what it means to Kant and is not what it means today, where it's reduced to uh, sort of computer logic as it were. You know, reason and logic do not mean the same thing. I mean, in Nyaya Vaisheshika, in, uh, you know, Mimamsa, in so many Indian philosophies, uh, there are so many different kinds of modes of reasoning which are considered, you know. So any simplistic, syllogistic or transitive reasoning is, is not all there is. There's a lot more. And those who have uh, studied logic carefully, whether it's Frege or Russell or Wittgenstein, they've always found uh, whatever be the dilations and elaborations of reason, they're always inadequate to what there actually is in life and the world, okay? So reason is necessary, but it's never sufficient, no matter how widely you can define it. You know, David Bohm, the quantum physicist, used to say, whatever we say something is, it's always something more and something different, you know? That's how inadequate language is, how you know, limited, limited our suggestiveness of the universe of meanings is, and so on. So ambiguities and uh, policymic qualities of words, these are essential things about language. And the richness and potential of language is to be explored. It can't be thrown out of the window. That's not, this is nonsense. Just because it does not fit somebody's scheme of logic and reasoning in a particular state of mind in a particular place, right? So a system of thought is never going to be exhaustive. And if I understand, I mean, you come from Austria, if I understand Kurt Goodell's uh, incompleteness theorems in mathematics at all, then what they're saying is every logical system has hidden axioms which are not obvious in the conclusions, and every logical system has conclusions which are not obvious from the axioms. And that's the nature of incompleteness of logic, you know? Now, you know, it takes a particular kind of, uh, you know, mathematical genius to reach that conclusion. Uh, lesser minds like mine will find it hard to, you know, uh, you know, get to that conclusion in an algebraically uh, rigorous way. But intuitively, it makes perfect sense to me that this should be the case, right? So uh, now, uh, answering Rajat's question in another way, look at today's world of business. Go and talk to any successful businessman or woman and ask them what they think of emotional in intelligence. Why did this idea emerge in the world of business? Precisely because the kind of logical intelligence they were working with till then was proving inadequate even in the rough and tumble of the business world, where without cooperation, you can't run a business organization, you can't run a corporation or a government or an NGO or anything. You know? So clearly, uh, there are intuitive forms of understanding. There are emotions in the human heart which are begging to be respected and understood on their own terms. 
and not just consigned to the bin of irrationality simply because it doesn't fit somebody's scheme of reason. I don't know if I'm making sense. It's a very complex topic and we can't do justice to it in limited time. But I hope I'm able to indicate that, uh, you know, the, the incompatibilities that are noticed sometimes between, for instance, love and reason are not so much uh, there in reality as in the head of the person who is counterposing them. Uh, Tagore, for instance, himself says, uh, if I recall that quotation from Stray Birds correctly, he says something like, uh, reason without love is like a dagger without a handle and it bleeds the hand that uses it, you see? So not only is there no incompatibility, the two need each other actually to function wisely and appropriately. Uh, there are people much more qualified than myself to speak about the topic. And I think of people like Ian McGilchrist, uh, The Master and the Emissary, a book which I highly recommend, uh, it's cognitive uh, you know, uh, scientist, neuroscientist, psychiatrist, and so on. Um, he dwells on this at great length and he gives a lot of interesting examples from the arts, from the sciences, from all walks of life to show how rich this whole thing is and how the mind cannot be reduced to reason. Thank you. Thank you, Swami, and congratulations on your book. Uh, thank you, Swami, for your presentation. Uh, Swami, Thank you very much for the uh, talk. Elise, uh, excuse me, do you think I could just take go around the corner for a second because it's a very dry yes. day and, and when I sure. drink a lot of water, I just need to listen to nature sure, calls. Sure, sure. Sorry, sure. one minute, I'll be back. Sure. Yes, I wait. Thank you for waiting. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, no, like, thank you for, for the talk, uh, Professor Pastava. Um, yeah, um, it's very, very livid, uh, not livid, how is it? Uh, yeah, giving a lot of, like, um, let's say, energy back to uh, think about things that I also um, make my research on. So my question would be, um, well, in terms of, the theme of the panel like how could you how would you describe or uh, like to phrase it in in uh, in short sentences like the decolonial approach then in, in your in your talk or like what would you pick out uh, or, or highlight like the, the, the decolonial approach because like uh, you talked about like okay we, we have like an imagination like there's an issue or um, about like the imagination part and then like people have also like my my um, um, point to imagination is like for example yeah we have reason and uh, metaphysics and enlightenment and the, the, for this particular term uh, ter for these terms are a very kind of dominating imagination right a colonial imagination maybe even and how would you say like like this this reason like the definition of reason and uh, metaphysics might also be like very constrained to that specific our our mind is constrained to this um, 
imagination. And then it's also uh, very static, right? So everything related to um, mystery and myths and everything not um, considered uh, in that uh, reasoning part, Eurocentric enlightenment and so on, there like how would you describe like i see there this kind of um, um difference of colonialism and determination of like uh colonial knowledge and uh, making it very static and therefore also very dominated and because of the static it's like institutionalized and stuff like this and everything else which is like actually very alive and it dies um it disappears it's like it's just non-static so it's not you cannot keep that knowledge or wisdom or reason, reason of the heart, the heart dies too. Like we cannot keep the heart forever in the library or something makes no sense. It would be very cruel, I think. Um, yeah, makes, yeah. So what do you think about like, okay, how would I describe the uh, decolonial things? Or what is like the main issue of decolonial uh, um, like approaches then? Um, because like, yeah, maybe there's a decolonial imagination that's like non-existent like because it's non-static or something like this um because um yeah we have a lot of debates but like we have a lot of wisdom and knowledge but somehow it's not um there because for the reason of non-static like we can we, we fight non-static with static notions so it makes no sense because it will be forever invisible right so it can be only experienced so Again, what would you say about how you describe or how would you relate yeah. to your topic, yeah. like the colonial approaches and maybe highlighting maybe also um, the, the, the position of phenomenology then in that uh, regard, because phenomenology is also rising in that decolonial approach too. Um, Thank you again. Another very, very important and interesting question. And again, something which will take an hour or two by itself to answer properly. Uh, but in brief, what I will say here, uh, how do you say your name? Nguyen? Nguyen? Is that how you say it? Yeah, it's like, like it's actually up, like, like yeah, it's like Dung V Nguyen. So it starts with a T Dung, there, but Dung. it's like Dung V Nguyen. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, I fought also from uh, Germany, and then there's like a lot of like very hardcore debates um, that um, it's like two different languages, okay. but anyway, yeah. So, uh, the the way to think about this, given how many times you use the word static in your question, would be to actually complain about notions of time that have gotten encrusted because of colonial and so-called post-colonial mode. See, I don't believe colonialism ever got over, by the way. I think it has only become a lot more entrenched, a lot more insidious, and a lot more dangerous. And now it has begun to colonize time and place in ways which are unprecedented. You know, this has not happened in history. It's only digital technology which has enabled this kind of conquest on this scale at this speed, you know? Uh, so actually, I personally think we are living in a time, I, I've, I've not written about this, I've only thought about it, and I'm only doing loud dreaming and thinking with you. We're living in a time of auto-colonization, if that makes sense. Each of us is being enticed to colonize ourselves. Each of us is being split into two, and one part is to dominate the other part in a very Nietzschean will-to-power way. Each of us is a potential anorexic, bulimic, and so on. That is the modern teaching, pride and power and glory and so on, you know. So this is a very Faustian sort of thing that is going on. Now, what's going wrong fundamentally is that, as Emerson once said, I think the elites always think that history ended yesterday, right? That's what it means to be an elite. It means to have arrived with a full stop, the period at the end of it. History has constant movement in the Heraclitian sense of all is flux and you don't step into the same river twice. That's not something elites are fond of. Insofar as they like history, it's about monumental history making in the Nietzschean sense, uh, as, he, as he put it in Untimely Meditations, you know, that, you know, elites like to think and, you know, making history, you know. 
it's it's uh, and and it's a bit like making omelets you know you got to break eggs to make omelets so you got to break people and and you, we're going to move fast and break things and be you know the social media bosses of the cosmos you know so the imagination that is going with all this is very much the conquistador imagination you know i mean the net result is that everybody's got a potential caesar sitting inside them and and christ is forgotten and buried somewhere and crucified and modernity has privatized even the crucifixion so you can't see that but you know people have paid huge hugely to win those wimbledon championships and win those wars and when they win you see the tears come out and then they recede again and then they go for the next victory and this is the definition of life because modern modernity is basically driven by an eliminationist ethos you know not the survival of the fittest, but the survival of the most powerful, the biggest, and so on. So what I'm trying to tell you here or, or share with you here is that the notion of time that modernity has been living with, number one, linear, number two, remorselessly forward-looking, moving forward, as we say in popular colloquial corrupted speech, moving forward. How do you know you're moving forward? And how do you know it's such a bad thing to recede or retreat or go back, you know, or go? I mean, maybe you're thinking that life is going on a straight line like that. But every time you think you're going there, you end up a little lower and a little lower and a little lower. And it may be a spiral that you are moving in. And that spiral may be in three dimensions or more than three dimensions. How can you be so sure of your notion of time? So you can't freeze time. You know, time is one of the great mysteries which has to be lived to be understood. You can't think about it. Like Augustine said, if you ask me, I know what is time, but if you ask me what it is, I can't tell you, you know. So there is there is this sense, uh, and it's something which I've uh, written in my uh, book, uh, the book which has gone to the publisher this week, The Grammar of Greed. Uh, there's a line there which I can share with you without any, uh, you know, uh, hesitation. And it's a line which is very experimental in my mind also. I just wanted to put it uh, before the reader. And it goes like this. Places are feminine. Time is masculine. And then in parenthesis, notice I'm not saying places are female and time is male. Okay. So... So this is like a line from the book. Now, I actually experience this on a daily basis. Uh, places can't run away, right? A tree is rooted where it is. Uh, a road or a, or, a, or a field or a forest or a river is where it is. It can't run away if it is invaded, if it is exploited, if it is ravaged and ravished. Where is it going to run to? But... There is some other force in the universe which is coming through time, perhaps, which can do the invading, which can do the raping and the exploiting and so on. Right? Uh, yeah, so in terms of decolonial, one has to be a little careful that one doesn't get caught in new binaries and traps because this path is full of them. And I'm sure you're aware of them. Uh, you know, even more than I am, because you do it in anthropology, uh, which is where a lot of the action is. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, um, you know, uh, it, it happens much too often nowadays that in the name of decoloniality, something else transpires, which we haven't had a good look at, and which subtly and insidiously pervades the new reality, you know. So, if modernity was going to free us, you know, two centuries are a lot. It should have done it by now, you know. I mean, in 1949, when the Chinese Revolution happened and Chu and Lai is asked by a Western reporter, uh, you know, what do you think of the French Revolution? And he said, it's still too early to say. But I think 75 years on, it's not too early to say. It's a bit late in the day. And if liberty, fraternity and equality were to be achieved, if those were the real goals, of the so-called enlightenment and the French Revolution, the number one Napoleon should not have invaded Egypt in 1798. And number two, the world should have become liberated, equal, and fraternal by now. 
and none of this has happened. Something else has taken place where security, prosperity, progress, and power have risen to new heights, and French Revolution seems passé. Uh, but who knows? Let's see what uh, November 24 yields in America and May 24 yields in India. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we have two more questions. One uh, concerns literature. First, the first question by Ruchi. Could you please suggest some text related to ecology of Hannah Arendt for further reading? Could someone answer the human condition as a suggestion. Um, so if you have more suggestions for Ruchi. Uh, well, with Arendt, I mean, if you can digest the human condition, you know a lot. I don't think anybody has been there, uh, perhaps not even Arendt, because the book is that rich. Uh, it's a profound book, and I would say in my limited reading, and I have not read very much, it's possibly among the five most important books of the last century, and it should be read very widely. Uh, Arendt's human condition is more important to me than Sein und Zeit, uh, Heidegger, and, and people like that. Uh, so the human condition is, I think, the canonical, uh, canonical in inverted commas, uh, text uh, for uh, understanding the notion of earth alienation and ecosophy. I think it's very, very important. Uh, the essay that she wrote very close to the book called um, The Conquest of Space and the Stature of Man. I want to say that's the title. And it's in a collection called Between Past and Future. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant essay. Uh, sharp, sharp, sharp. Uh, that's uh, highly recommended to grasp uh, you know, what she's trying to say with Earth alienation. Um, the interesting thing about Arendt is that she does not make explicit comments or she does not say explicit things about the ecological crisis. But the way she approaches philosophy and the way she approaches the nature of thought and the way she understands the modern polity and she's very humble when she says, I'm not a political philosopher. You can call me a political thinker, but I'm not a political philosopher. And I think she's trying to say, I'm not Machiavelli or Hobbes or you know, uh, John Rawls or somebody like that. You know, I'm a political thinker. And But the way she approaches all this is just so rich. And what Gwen was saying earlier, that you know, things keep slipping through the cracks and things keep vanishing, the heart does not live forever and all that. This is exactly why Arendt is careful to not allow others to typecast her as X or Y or Z. See, labeling is for those who cannot think. And this is what I think. <laughs> if you know how to think, and if you have the courage to think, you would not label so much. Then you would not deal in ideological currency and coin then you will reason, you will discuss, you will dialogue, you will try to persuade or get persuaded, etc. You are pliable, you're vulnerable to all sorts of things, not, not just reason. Uh, but in our highly ideologized times where everything is hyper-politicized, especially in a country like India, but everywhere in the world, I think politics is a disease. I mean, to me, I mean, politics is an ailment. I mean, uh, politics is what a man does to run away from himself, you know. Uh, if you're not philosophical, you're missing something fundamental about the nature of existence. And people who engage too much with politics are actually not philosophical enough because ultimately they see power as something desirable. And uh, it's a very tricky thing, very, very, very tricky. So, uh, and a lot of this we owe exactly to the Enlightenment, but I would go a little before that. And I would go in my book, with, in my next book, which I've resumed work on now, The Alphabet of Ecosophy, I'm actually dealing with three major uh, figures of modernity, uh, of cognitive intellectual modernity, uh, Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes, and Thomas Hobbes. Uh, and these are the three foundational figures of the scientific revolution 
philosophically speaking, Galileo and others, of course, scientifically speaking, who lay the, the rudiments and the basic uh, scaffolding and framework on which everything else comes later in the Enlightenment. Uh, and if people think that there is a direct line between the Renaissance and the scientific revolution, I think that's highly debatable. I think that a lot of the Renaissance, for instance, things about magic and so on, were lost by the scientific revolution. And Hobbes was a paranoid figure, I think, uh, when he wrote Leviathan and when he proposed it as the answer to the miseries of humanity and the social contract will solve everything. This Leviathan was supposed to tackle human insecurity and the modern state is the most insecurity generating machine that humanity could have invented, you know. There's a great poem of Nietzsche in Zarathustra called Of the New Idol. Uh, it's about the modern state where he lists in the most, uh, you know, prophetic poetry uh, that, you know, uh, there's nothing that comes close to the modern state when it comes to crime and evil and so on. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I think that Arendt... Um, you know, was wise to not allow herself to be typecast as uh, this or that. And in the process, she was able to retain richness of thought. And she had the courage to think fearlessly and fiercely uh, wherever the truth might lead her. And uh, I think that The Human Condition is a masterpiece. It's an, it's an absolutely brilliant book. And especially the last chapter, The Vita Activa and the Human Condition, uh, The Vita Activa and the Modern World. Uh, where she accuses scientists of being the only people who have the privilege of action. And in the process, much that was so essential and necessary to action classically conceived in the Western sense, that is to say, uh, the actors of the, uh, the Greek polis or the Roman Senate, that has completely gone from the modern world. And you're living in an inert world of producers and consumers in other words, job holders and slaves and uh, consumers, uh, and we are given to our appetites and we look for the best meals and the best restaurants and we travel around the world for that and things like that. So um, there is, uh, you know, a lot of ecological depth in uh, implicit in Arendt's uh, ideas in the human condition. Um, there are some, not many, there are some good commentaries on Arendt's ecology. And one of them, if I recall right, his name is David Macaulay. Uh, there's a collection called Minding Nature, in which there are several people who have written about ecological philosophers like Arendt, like Hans Jonas and others. And that's worth looking at too. Thank you. Last question, uh, one more, which is also in the chat from Hari Narayanan. Do you think the cognitive, do you think the cognitive collective failure is largely a matter of the way the self is understood? Somehow of the view that viewing self as an inner entity started with literacy and subsequent developments inflated it. If, it, if that is the case, then the remedy would lie in reconceptualizing the self as belonging to the world and not as an inner separative entity. What is your view on it? Please give me a minute to just read the question again because I missed some of what was said. Just one minute. Sure. From Excellent uh, comment and question. Um, absolutely right. I tend to agree with Hari. I think that um, I'm personally much closer to somebody like Jay Krishnamurti when he says, you are the world. Uh, than to the modern liberals for whom possessive individualism is the self. Am I making sense? Um, so the, the Upanishads, for instance, they speak about tattvam asi, which translates to thou art that, right? 
So I am not separate from the tree that I'm looking at. Martin Buber in, uh, uh, what's the title of Buber's book? Uh, somebody help me out. Um, I and Thou, is that right? Yeah. Thou and I, something like that. Uh, this is what he says. And that little three or four page section in the book where he's discussing the his relationship to the tree is very, very eloquent and very poetic and poignant and he says there that I'm not separate from this that I'm looking at. Uh, I I do, in a sense, become the tree in the process of looking at the tree. So it ceases to be an object and there is an intersubjectivity which kicks into life, so to speak, and which transfuses him with all sorts of emotions which are not that easy to articulate. We do, often don't have the language for it. But the reality of it is very much there, and hence poetry and music and dance and so many things. The multiple registers and languages in which humanity expressing itself expresses itself, some of them are much more basic and pri primary compared to verbal language. So um, I'm very much with you here. I think that viewing the self as a merely inner entity as something merely subjective is flawed. And I think Mr. Uh, what's his name, Monsieur Descartes, you know, when, you know, he goes inwards and from there goes straight to God and gets proof of uh, existence of everything and so on. Um, I think Cartesian dualism uh, set the foundations of modern cultural metropolitan solipsism. Uh, and a certain kind of metro liberal solipsism now rules the roost in woke culture. And I, I think it's very tricky and dangerous. And I think that one needs to look at this with a much cleaner you know, lens and with a much sharper scalpel and remove a lot of the fat that has gathered around some of our notions uh, and which are getting us into uh, needless confusions. Uh, so the moment the self is not something which is easily located within, but the moment the self is something which is, you know, intrinsically bound up with relationship, the relational view of the self uh, actually makes it much more interesting. And it's then neither inside nor outside and also inside and outside and that boundary between inside and outside itself becomes terribly permeable. And all sorts of interesting creative uh, catalysis can happen. But if we're going to drown ourselves in very limited, finite notions of the self as they have been presented by liberal or fascist or communist thought, then I'm sorry, you know, that will lead us down wrong ideological pathways. Thank you. I think Nirbhay has a comment, maybe short. We are way beyond uh, time. Yeah, I'll be very quick. I'll be yeah. very quick. Uh, speaking about what you said on te from Tagore, uh, that we uh, humanity is like a vulture which is uh, by uh, grabbing at carrion or something, grabbing the world. And if you link, uh, you think about a vulture, how the vulture is also the carrion and the carrion is also the vulture. You can also apply that thought to uh, a vulture. So why mm. uh, d why dismiss the vulture? So I think somewhere Tagore's uh, southern upbringing was also making him look at Dalit, Bahujan, Adivasi modes of life, which were often caste-based impositions on them from southern culture, uh, was also called making him uh, refer to a general move of industrial modernity uh, linking up with Brahminical patriarchy to uh, refer to uh, what was happening overall as a vulture, as the behavior of a vulture, as a scavenger behavior or whatever. Okay. Half of me is with you. The other half is not. And I'll first speak about the half which is with you. I My sympathies are also with the vulture. I think that vultures are an unnecessarily maligned, uh, uh, you know, lot. And uh, uh, especially given the fact that you have diclofenac, which has poisoned the hell out of them and rendered them all but instinct for no fault of theirs. 
you know, you know the whole link between uh, you know uh, pesticides having diclofenac, which is not poisonous for cattle, but is poisonous for the vultures who feed on the carrion, and therefore vultures go extinct and so on. And in fact, that's the reason for the explosion of population of dogs in India. Uh, the explosion of uh, strays on Indian streets is because vultures are not there. So the dogs have been feeding on, you know, dead cattle and multiplying much faster than would be ecologically, uh, you know, uh, equilibrating, shall we say. In any case, uh, so, you know, one should take all animal or bird or any such metaphor, you know, like when we say he's a snake, you know, uh, that doesn't mean I'm sovereign or something, you know. Uh, you will find the uh, usage of, I mean, I, for instance, was in Andhra once and I was talking to a Dalit family and they said about SEZ, special economic zones, that you know, uh, it's one of those policies which should be nipped in the bud. And then somebody used this metaphor that uh, before the snake gets any bigger, kill it, you know. So now that's a Dalit family using a, an angry metaphor, uh, using a snake uh, as an image. Uh, so one should not take this beyond a certain limit and, uh, you know, start going into caste battles because we'll just waste a lot of energy in those battles. Uh, now, uh, part of India's problem right now is that caste is being essentialized to the point of ridiculousness. And it's a very long discussion, uh, but just like with everything else which should not be essentialized, caste should not be essentialized either. For instance, people say Brahmins are like this and Brahmins are like that. Now, the other day I went to Aravali Biodiversity Park here in Gurgaon, and I talked to two security guards. Both of them were Brahmins. Both of them living on twelve to 14,000 rupees a month. Both of them supporting families of five to seven people. Compare him with a Dalit millionaire who's part of the Dalit Chamber of Commerce. Or compare him to our OBC Prime Minister. And how does that sit with traditional ideologies about caste and so on? So there's a huge amount of flux, huge amount of change. And all these generalizations about upper caste are like this and Brahmins are like that or patriarchs are like all these things. I take all of them with a large pinch of salt now because things are in so much flux and we, we, we waste a lot of time in essentializing things which are in constant motion. We were talking about notions of time earlier and this is one of the things which we need to ask ourselves whether caste is really as static as we've been taught to believe or is there fluidity? Look at Susan Bailey's work, look at Nicholas Dirks's work, look at Shumit Guha's work and they're all saying the same thing about the colonial period. The ossification of the Indian caste system actually increases, does not decrease after 1861 census and so on, after the Minto Morley reforms of 1909. So um, there's a lot that needs to be said here, uh, and I would rather look at things a bit more provisionally and in a lot more qualified way. But I completely take your point that sometimes we are unnecessarily unjust and cruel to animals and birds when we use them as metaphors for our own social purposes. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. I think we we bothered you a long time. Thank you so much for taking that much time to answer all our questions. Thank you again so much for a very enriching and inspiring talk for all of us. Thank you to everybody who has been there and will stay there much longer than planned. To all students, colleagues, and everybody taking time again on the off day. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, all over the world. And we'll meet you next month again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank My, you very much. I learned nice much. See you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 See you next time. Bye. Bye.